Hello, this is Mr. Zamoyski, chemistry teacher at North Tonawanda High School, and this is the pre-lab video for the quarter one lab titled Heating Curve of H2O. This lab is going to take a look at phase changes and what happens during phase changes or changes in state of matter, and we're going to look at this happening with an everyday substance, water. From your everyday life, you're probably familiar with the states of matter of water or phases of matter of water. The lowest phase is for ice, where we have water, uh, and it freezes and turns into a solid. It's very cold, and also it has this very rigid structure. We can make it into cubes or to any shape we want. When the ice melts, it turns into water, and it flows freely, uh, but still fits to the size of its container. And then lastly, when we heat up water, it boils and turns into steam or water as a gas. Now, you may understand how those changes happen on an everyday large-scale level, but how about the small particle level? What's actually going on? So we're going to use a simulation to take a look at the states of matter and the phase changes and what happens with the particles of water. To look at water at the particle level, we're going to go to one of my favorite science sites. This is phat.colorado.edu. Um, it's a free site um, that works out of the University of Colorado at Boulder, and they make simulations for all subjects. Uh, so we're going to click on um, Play with Simulations, click on the Chemistry tab, and we're going to scroll all the way down to States of Matter Basics. This simulation runs in HTML5, which means it's compatible with any device, computer, laptop, tablet, or cell phone. So we're going to press play, load the simulation, and we're going to go to states of matter here. And we have at various atoms and molecules we can use, and then we have tabs for the three states of matter, plus a heat control here so we can add or remove energy uh, to make these particles do different things. Um, I'm going to stick with neon here uh, as opposed to water, what we're actually working with. I think the simulation represents uh, a little bit more clearly with this neon here. So if we look at neon as a solid here, uh, we see that all the particles are very close together, they're vibrating a little bit, and we just sort of have this rigid cube going on here. Um, and as you can see, it's very cold, uh, 13 Kelvin or minus 260 degrees Celsius. Um, and then when we heat it up or add energy, what's going to happen is these particles are going to be able to move past each other a little bit more, and eventually will turn into a liquid. I'm just going to click on the tab, and as you can see, the particles now can slide past each other. They're vibrating, but they're also moving past each other. And um, the only thing I don't like about the simulation is, well, it's kind of doing it right now, but not as clearly. The particles should spread out to fill the container. Um, that is true of any liquid. Um, but for the most part, this shows what a liquid is and that the particles are able to move and flow past each other. As we add energy, okay, the particles are going to move even more and spread apart, and the temperature goes up and they spread out even more. I'm just going to click on the gas icon here, and as you can see, the particles are separated from each other. They're bouncing into each other, uh, but they have large distances between them, and they're really not sticking together in any capacity. Um, so if we were to zoom in on water or any substance uh, and look at the phase changes, we would see this happening at the particle level. In the simulation, we saw that water as ice, or any matter as a solid, has the particles close together, and their movement is limited to vibrations. When it turns into water, the particles are now able to slide past each other. And that's whether we're dealing with water or any other substance as a liquid. Then when we get to steam, or the gas phase of any form of matter, the particles are far apart, they're moving around pretty quickly, and they bounce off of each other and the walls in their container. For each substance, this happens at different temperatures, uh, but we're going to focus on when these phase changes occur, or these changes in states of matter occur for water. Ice to water occurs at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is equal to 0 degrees Celsius, or 273 Kelvin. 
for going from water to steam to make water boil. So that's going to happen at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is equal to 100 degrees Celsius, or 373 Kelvin. And for this lab, what we're going to do is we're going to start at the melting point and work our way up until we go past the boiling point of water. So let's begin the lab. In terms of the chemicals we use for this lab, this is a pretty safe lab. We're dealing with ice water and steam, all forms of water, something we need to survive. Uh, however, a big hazard for this lab will be in concerning heat and fire. Uh, we're going to be working with a Bunsen burner and open flames. We're also going to be working with glassware, so in that case we want our goggles on. Um, also, since we're working with fire, any loose clothing, I have my sleeves unbuttoned here, I'm going to roll those up so that there's no possibility that they dangle over into the fire. If you're wearing, wearing any sort of looser, baggy clothing, we're not going to wear that the day of this lab we're doing it. Um, also, I have elected to put on an apron. Uh, this is not essential for this lab, but I do want it to prevent my necktie from going over into the fire. In terms of our equipment that we need here, we're going to need our Bunsen burner. We're going to need things to hold hot glassware with, so that's our rubber holders and a set of tongs. We'll have a beaker to contain our ice water mixture. We'll need a thermometer. We'll need a wire mesh, and we're going to use this to put our beaker on as we're heating it. And then lastly, you'll need either an iron tripod. They're located around the outside of the lab stations. Or you can elect to use a stand with an iron ring. And these iron rings and, and stands are hanging out around the outside of the lab, hanging over the sinks. Uh, to set this up, you just lower it down onto here and then screw the ring into place. And then it's nice and secure so it won't go anywhere. To begin this lab, I'm going to take a beaker and fill it with a little bit of water. And I'll gra grab some ice as well. So now my sample is ready to go. I'm going to use my Bunsen burner here, but not light it yet, to figure out what height I want for my ring stand here. Um, I don't want that big of a flame, so I'm going to lower this just so we have a relatively short flame that we'll need to heat this up. I'm going to put my wire mesh on top here and put my beaker of water on top. I'm going to let the thermometer sit in there for a little bit. The temperature is currently dropping, and that will be our starting temperature. While we're waiting for this, I'm going to grab the materials I need to light my Bunsen burner. Before you light your Bunsen burner, check to make sure that the gas line underneath your station is open. You want that valve to be pointing to the side and not down. Down means that it's closed, to the side means it's opened. If the gas doesn't come out, after that happens, check with your teacher and make sure that he's turned on the main gas line. You're going to move your Bunsen burner out from underneath what you're working with here with your ice water mixture and stick the hose into the natural gas line. Make sure the area is clear of any papers or anything that might possibly catch on fire if you were to accidentally knock the burner over. Remember that you want the bottom valve to be open just a little bit. To make sure, turn it all the way to the right or clockwise. And that means it's closed completely and no gas will be coming from the main gas line into your Bunsen burner. Turn it a couple turns to the left or counterclockwise and that will open it up. Whether you're working with a partner or not to light your Bunsen burner, remember that you always light your match first and then turn on the gas line. We don't want any natural gas flowing without it burning. Uh, otherwise, we have a possibility of an explosion, or we could have some ill health effects. Remember that if you're feeling dizzy, lightheaded, nauseous, or all of a sudden you just don't feel well, let your partner know and your teacher, and your instructor will have you and your partner either go outside to get some fresh air, or we'll send you to the nurse.
I will light my match. Then I will turn on the gas. I'm going to control my flame. I don't want it this big. So I'm going to turn the valve underneath. Until I get the flame to be lower. That's a nice height. And then what I'll do is I will slide it underneath. Okay. At this point, I want to start recording the temperature. It looks like we're at about 3 degrees Celsius. Okay. It may not be exactly at 0 degrees Celsius, which we established was the melting point, but these thermometers aren't perfect. From this point forward, we're not going to do anything except watch the temperature and record it every minute on our data table. A note about recording your temperature values. You're going to leave your thermometer sitting in there as you wait for your minute to pass, but when you actually record your temperature, what you want to do is take the thermometer and stir it around a little bit, particularly when the ice water is in here, to make sure that you get the actual temperature of the ice water mixture and not just the bottom of the beaker, which will be hotter because it is closer to the flame. The temperature was climbing slowly for a while, but now that all the ice has melted, the temperature has been going up rapidly. It took about four to five minutes for all the ice to melt, and now we're counting the temperature going up. Like I said, before it was going up about one to two degrees per minute, per minute. now it's five to seven degrees per minute. We'll keep an eye on this, but continue to record the temperature every minute. I've been heating my water for about 15 minutes right now, and we're at 88 degrees Celsius. We can see that some water particles here are starting to turn from liquid to gas as indicated by the small bubbles forming here. We're going to keep going though until this thing is bubbling in its entirety, not just at the bottom. Now we have a steady boil going. There's bubbles rapidly flowing to the top of our water sample here. Uh, I'm at about 97 degrees Celsius at this point. You're going to keep going until you can get past the boiling point, which we know is to be 100 degrees Celsius. Now, these thermometers are a little old, so you may have something a little bit above or a little bit below, um, but you want to go past the boiling point, and that way you know you're done. When you're done with your measurements, you can clean up as follows. First of all, turn off the gas line from the main gas valve. Next, Take the thermometer out, grab it as far away from the hot part as possible. You can just set that aside. Next what you'll do is use either the tongs or the rubber hands. Um, I prefer the rubber gloves in this case. You're going to take the hot glassware and you're going to set it aside. You're going to grab another piece of wire mesh and let it sit on there for a while to let it cool off. Actually before you even do that you can just pour the water out into the sink. Now you can let the glassware cool off. At this point you can take your hot pieces of metal here that you're using to heat it. You're going to set it aside to the front of the lab. Your instructor will show you where that is and that way no one will have accidentally touch it because it's a hot metal. Once you've collected all of your temperature data over time you're going to end up making a scatter plot of your data. On the horizontal axis, or the x-axis, that will be your time. Make sure to label that you were measuring your time in minutes. On the vertical axis, or the y-axis, we're going to put our temperature value. Then what we'll do is we'll plot our points using our data. And you'll end up analyzing that relationship. That's it for the pre-lab video for the heating curve of H2O. Make sure to read over the procedure, answer all of the pre-lab questions, and make sure you're appropriately dressed before you come in for this lab. Have a great day!